Good evening. I'm Trisha Craig, Vice President of Engagement here at Yale and U.S. College, and I am delighted to welcome you who are here in our audience in the Performance Hall and our viewers who are watching online to tonight's talk, One Belt, One Road, or One Sea, One Temple, the Historical Transformation of Temples and Association Networks in Singapore and Southeast Asia by Professor Kenneth Bean. Before I turn the stage over to tonight's moderator, I have just a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, we ask that you do not take recordings or photos or screenshots of the talk, but rest assured, we will make a video of the session available on the college's YouTube channel quite soon. Second, and more importantly, we really welcome your questions, and we hope that you'll ask yours during the Q&A portion of the evening. And so for those of you who are here with us in person, our wonderful student associates will come with a microphone and you can ask a question. And for those of you who are watching online, you can enter your questions uh, on the Zoom screen into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will pass along your questions. So now, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Jack Mengta Chia. Dr. Chia is Assistant Professor of History and Religious Studies at NUS, whose work focuses on Buddhism and Chinese popular religion. He specializes in Buddhism in maritime Southeast Asia and has broader research interests in migration, diasporas, transnationalism, pilgrimage, and religious diplomacy. His work has received international attention and has been widely translated. And last year, Dr. Chia was elected a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Let me now invite him to the stage. Dr. Chia, please. Thank you, Trisha. Good evening, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen. A very good evening to all of you. It's a great honor for me to introduce my esteemed colleague and friend, Professor Kenneth Dean. Professor Dean, known to his students respectfully as Ding Lao Shi, is the Guanyin Dong Huzhu Temple Professor at Yale and U.S. College and Professor of Chinese Studies at the National University of Singapore. Professor Dean was born in Rotterdam. His parents were United States of America diplomats, and he was raised in Taiwan and Hong Kong. He attended Brown University and Fudan University during his undergraduate years. He later went to Stanford and UC Berkeley to study Chinese literature and Taoism. To deepen his understanding of Taoism, Professor Dean went to Paris to study with Professor Christopher Schipper, who introduced him to Taoist master Chen Rongsheng in Tainan, Taiwan. Professor Dean spent the following year in Taiwan and the next two years in Fujian province of China. There, he studied the revival of popular Chinese religion and Taoist rituals in Fujian not long after the Cultural Revolution. After receiving his PhD, he took on a postdoc fellowship at UC Berkeley. Thereafter, he went to McGill University, where he taught for 25 years. In 2015, Professor Dean joined NUS to serve as the head of the Chinese Studies Department and leader of the Religion and Globalization Research Cluster in the Asia Research Institute. With support from research grants from the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, National Heritage Board, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Housing and Development Board, Singapore Chinese Cultural Center, and NUS, Professor Dean has published several books and articles on Chinese religion in Singapore. He set up the Singapore Historical GIS website to gather together data on Chinese temples and institutions that have played a key role in building Singapore from the ground up. I first encountered Professor Dean's work when I was an undergraduate at NUS. I remember my honest TC advisor said to me, to understand Chinese religion, you must read Ken Dean's books. Professor Dean's groundbreaking book, Taoist Ritual and Popular Cults of Southeast China, really inspired me to think about issues in religion and local society which influenced the way I look at Buddhism in Southeast Asia. In 2011, 
I had the pleasure of attending Professor Dean's Chinese Temples of Singapore Summer Seminar, where my classmate and I had a wonderful time reading and discussing about Buddhist monasteries, Taoist temples, sectarian organizations, home shrines, and scary Chinese cemeteries. Right? So you can imagine how much fun we had. I'm very lucky to be back teaching at NUS after my PhD when I continue to learn and benefit from Professor Dean's wisdom. I can go on and on about Professor Dean's amazing scholarship and his influence on my career, but I must stop here. Professor Dean's talk today is entitled One Belt, One Road, or One Sea, One Temple, the historical transformation of temples and association networks in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ding Lao Shi. Thank you very much, Jack and Tricia, for the introductions. Uh, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm very excited to share this research with you and uh, hope you will find it interesting too. Uh, one belt, one road. Everyone is familiar with the amazing amount of uh, investment and uh, going on from China in Southeast Asia along the Silk Road. Is this okay? Okay. Can you hear me all right? Oh, good. Uh, but you may not yet have heard of this alternative uh, slogan. So let me go right into my talk. Uh, let's see what is the best way to move forward. Click this one. Oh, that one. Okay, good. So these are some of the themes of tonight's talk. Uh, Singapore, as you know, developed into a commercial and cultural hub of central importance to this region. But I argue that Chinese temples, regional and clan associations played really central role in the 19th century in establishing what I call uh, trade and business trust networks based in the temples and the associations. They also contributed to building the actual physical uh, Singapore. Many of the temple committees were businessmen who were landowners, built uh, um, street after street of shop houses uh, downtown. We can actually follow the uh, development, concrete development of the built environment of Singapore by exploring the work of these uh, temple committee members. Uh, now, these groups uh, also contributed substantially to nation building in China at the, in the first half of the 20th century. And after Singapore's independence, uh, temples and associations became localized and aided in the transformation of the urban built environment. Sometimes they didn't have much choice, <laughs> as we'll explain as uh, we look into the very rapid transformations of the built environment in Singapore uh, in the uh, uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, for years after the gradual reestablishment of relations with China, which officially took place in 1990, these groups helped rebuild the religious system of their ancestral communities in Fujian, Guangdong, and Hainan uh, in China, while uh, continuing to build and rebuild economic and cultural ties with those uh, communities. And in the 21st century, these networks have reinvented themselves, utilizing social media and modern transportation and generating new regional and even global networks. Uh, they've also shown incredible resilience in response to the COVID pandemic, finding new ways to do digital religion. Uh, and we'll explore in this talk uh, briefly, the past, present and future uh, roles of the Chinese temples and associations in Singapore and beyond. So, the talk is arranged in three parts. Uh, how do temples and associations form transnational alliances and build networks? I'll give you one recent example. And then I'll talk about uh, four or five historical stages in the changing roles of the temples and associations. And finally, I'll ask some questions about transcending dialect and ethnic boundaries and whether this is the past or the future for Singapore. So one belt, one road, one sea, one temple. One Belt, One Road, you've all seen the charts, the diagrams, uh, the a massive amount of investment. It's an ongoing, incredibly uh, major series of investments around uh, both the uh, Silk Road of, the, of Central Asia and the so-called Silk Road of the Sea. Uh, but in response to that, a small temple in, of all places, Cebu, Sarawak, 
came up with a counter slogan, uh, Ihai Email. Uh, now this is a very horizontal network uh, that links together the uh, temples uh, of the earth god of each of the port cities of Southeast Asia. They've built it up over about 10 to 15 years into an association of roughly 120 temples from uh, 60 or 70 uh, t uh, port cities around Southeast Asia. And I'll explain a little bit about the history and activities of this group. It started long ago in a small <laughs> bend in the Rajan River in uh, Sarawak. Uh, probably that little pink building in the corner uh, may be the early temple building itself in the artist's imagination. Nowadays, the city looks like this. Uh, you can see the big government building in the middle there. And if you look just below it, you'll see a church steeple. Those are the Methodists who moved there with Huang Nai Shang and others uh, uh, in the 19 uh, teens, uh, 1905, they first got there. But even earlier, you see the pagoda just in front of the uh, church steeple. That's the temple we'll be talking about, the Yung An Ting Da Ba Gong Miao. And that's what it looks like uh, from the front. And if we look at it from the back, it faces right onto the river and the ports uh, for all the trade going up and down the Rajan River. When I first went there, those, the river was filled with timber, uh, amazing amounts of timber. I'd never seen so much wood in my life, uh, just coming down the river. Now it's all gone, uh, literally all gone. And uh, in the process, uh, being replaced by palm oil plantations and other forms of commercial uh, cropping and, and mining. Uh, so the communities that lived upriver have been greatly disrupted by this uh, deforestation, naturally, but it's brought a lot of uh, wealth to the area. Um, here's a historical timeline. Uh, we believe it was founded in 1871. Uh, Kuching, uh, the Subu has some graves going back to the 1840s from Chinese uh, visitors and merchants. And uh, what's interesting is that the statue of the god, the earth god, was brought to the temple from Xiamen and survived a fire in 1928 when the whole temple and most of the city was burned down and survived uh, the allied bombing that took place in uh, 45. So people believe the uh, earth god statue is very ling, very filled with power. Here is a photograph of it from the uh, 70s or 80s, when he's being carried in procession around the streets of uh, Cebu uh, with all sorts of performances and uh, spirit possession uh, part of that uh, process. This is the inscription from the uh, uh, temple from the 1890s, uh, which lists all the associations that were uh, supporting this temple. And they were associations of Hokkien merchants up and down all the major rivers of Sarawak, the Rajan River, the Sarawak River, all the way to Kuching, where the uh, earth god temples there are still a very important part of the local landscape. So over the, over the recent uh, 10 or 15 years, a series of gatherings have taken place in Sarawak, starting in Sabah, but then the uh, Cebu temple got interested and started doing festivals, inviting more people to visit. Eventually, they began to hold their own uh, festivals of the earth god uh, in uh, Cebu in 2010, and again in 2017, where they held uh, and formed a world Dabogong uh, federation, or a world earth god federation, and held a festival to which they invited uh, over 80 uh, temple representatives from all around uh, Sarawak and beyond. So within Sarawak, we can see that in the early period before 1900, there were several uh, Dabogong temples in many in Kuching, as you can see, and then up uh, along the coast, all the way up to Miri and in Cebu as well. If you take the next phase from 1900 to 1950, these Orange dots represent new temples, newly founded earth god temples that are uh, coming in as uh, certain communities get more established in the region. And if you go from 1950 to 2000, you get a lot more of the black uh, points. So this is quite a substantial number of earth god temples, and they were all invited and included in the uh, earth god federation and uh, became part of the network. Now that network was formed by a process of 
physical visits to other temples. Uh, so delegates from the Subu Yunganting, Dabo Gong Miao, would uh, take uh, first buses and then airplanes to the Philippines, and then on up to Taiwan, which is a little obscured in this image, and then across to Xiamen, uh, and then down to uh, Hong Kong and Macau, and then further down to Vietnam, to Ho Chi Minh, to Cambodia, uh, and over to Thailand, and over to Mandian, to Yap, uh, Rangoon, down again to the Malay, uh, Malaysian Peninsula, all the way down the peninsula where they split. Uh, one group went into Indonesia, through Sumatra, to Java, and then rejoined the other group uh, in, uh, back in uh, Borneo and uh, returned to their home temple. In this process, they uh, established relations, invited all these uh, temples to send representatives to their big uh, events, and arranged uh, a kind of a, a series of gatherings that would be held in different places within the network over the following years. And uh, these are some of the temples that they brought in to, to their, their new found uh, network, some from Taiwan, some from Malaysia, some from Xiamen, some from Rangoon, and so forth. Uh, so it, uh, it really spread very quickly. Uh, one of the most important uh, earth god temples that they included was that in Sinkawang. Uh, Sinkawang is a very remote town on the uh, uh, western edge of uh, Galimantan, uh, Borneo, and uh, has a major earth god temple amongst many other Chinese temples. This was the town that was at the foot of the mountains where the Lanfang Gong Si was established. Many of you will be familiar with the Lanfang Gong Si, which was a kind of kingdom of Chinese uh, Gong Si and federations that existed overseas uh, in Borneo for about 80 years, uh, from the 17, 17, late 1700s through to the 1840s or 50s. Uh, they uh, were groups of gold miners who banded together uh, in big confederations of uh, uh, gathered together in larger temples and went into battle against the Dutch, against the, the Malay rulers, against the Dayak, uh, against each other, <laughs> led by spirit mediums into battle uh, from their various uh, major temples. So uh, that community, at, sadly, was driven out of the, of the uh, mountains and into the city. A lot of refugees ended up in Sinkawang, but Sinkawang had originally had a lot of connections with China as the main export area for uh, the gold that had come through and all the, the supplies coming in. To this day, they have hundreds of temples and many, many spirit uh, medium shrines. I was just there recently and attended the uh, Zapko Mei, the uh, Lantern Festival, in which uh, literally 1,200 spirit medium troops, uh, 1,200 sedan chairs carried by groups of five to 10 uh, young men went through the streets with the spirit mediums on top of them, uh, past the Earth God Temple and, and about 50,000 people in the parade. There's only 250,000 people in the whole town. So the, the whole rest of the town came to watch the parade. Of, of, uh, but what was most curiously about this was that about half of them were uh, Dayak uh, spirit mediums. And it turned out that about half of that number were Chinese dressed as Dayaks, uh, who had learned from Dayak uh, spirit mediums how to become possessed by the gods the day before the procession is actually the really interesting day. That's when they visit all of the temples that they're going to pass in the procession the following day. And each medium in turn asks the permission of the gods, drops spirit medium to Wabui, uh, and asks if it's all right to uh, proceed to the next temple. So this takes a lot of time <laughs> and is very filled with all sorts of uh, exciting uh, uh, trance experiences and uh, performances. So that, it was quite important for the uh, Sibu uh, one, one C, One Temple network to include Sinkawang, because Sinkawang is such a vibrant expression of, of Chinese popular culture and a, such an interesting example of how uh, other ethnicities, such as the Dayak, have now joined into, which is a very much a kind of a Chinese uh, spirit medium procession. Uh, we'll come back to this question a little bit later. but. Uh, I want to show you some of their uh, artwork for their brand, for the One Sea, One Temple. Here you see the temple sort of on the edge of the sea and a, and a junk off in the distance. Uh, there's a kind of a vision of it. You see that now the uh, 
rainbow forming and the sea coming in a little closer as this temple starts to float off into the ocean. <laughs> That's uh, the idea of an autonomous uh, node in a network that has uh, all kinds of uh, power through its connections, other people joining in and supporting them in and supporting their autonomy is uh, the kind of brilliant uh, vision that you see here. And I didn't think this was uh, anything I'd find in, in real life, but I did find this temple in the middle of the ocean, uh, just off the coast of Sabah, <laughs> a Shenten Shandi temple built by Chaozhou migrants. Uh, so indeed, you can have your own pirate ship and call it a temple if you, if you want to. Uh, it's a kind of a vision that I find very interesting, in, particularly in response to the uh, One Belt, One Road, which is so much top-down and so much uh, government uh, investment and so much uh, uh, so problematic for many smaller communities on the ground uh, that don't have too many negotiating rights in the face of such major investment plans and development plans. So this, uh, I think, was done intentionally. This Ihai email slogan uh, is kind of fun, and I think they, they know it. Uh, it continues to grow. And I was curious, when it came to Singapore, who would join? We have at least 25, probably 45 uh, Dabogong temples around Singapore. Uh, this is just a brief listing that I got from uh, Victor Ye's wonderful uh, Singapore uh, Taoism uh, listserv. Uh, but you notice the fourth one here, the Munsan Fuk Fuk Tok Chi, this one. Munsan Fuk Tok Chi is a Cantonese uh, temple, goes way back to the very early founding days of Singapore. Uh, and why this temple of all Singapore earth god temples uh, would want to join the uh, global uh, earth god federation? That was a question I, I took to the, to the advisors of the temple. They said they felt that this was a great way to highlight the importance of this particular temple, which is still uh, in a kind of a gray zone when it comes to uh, cultural heritage, and it's uh, not able yet to become a national monument, though they've been applying for years. They thought this would give them more visibility and more support if they could have this kind of uh, international network that they were part of, they were representing Singapore in a sense. They also told me some interesting things about the plans for the network. Originally, they were going to have a meeting in Macau, but COVID got in the way. And the problem, the interesting thing about the Macau meeting was that the temples in Macau are now pretty much controlled by the Chinese uh, United Front uh, uh, through its uh, local representatives. They uh, figured this was a way probably to join this federation in a way to in uh, invite them all and become uh, somehow involved and learn more about this network as it was forming under our very eyes, if you like. Of course, that didn't happen. There's still some talk of it happening in the near future. So we'll see what happens once... Uh, there are different kinds of political dimensions to these networks. Uh, and a, another group, another group that had promised to hold a, uh, a gathering was in Malong, of all places, in Indonesia, in Java. And as many of you will know, this is nowhere near the ocean. <laughs> so the point now becomes an imaginary uh, ocean uh, or a very large island, sense of an island, uh, is also possible. You can also join. Uh, if you have the, the will to do so from uh, almost any point in, in Southeast Asia. So this, these are, this is an example of a newly formed uh, network that's uh, developed really in the last 10 to 15 years. And I have to say it's just one of thousands of such networks. Uh, almost all the temples have multiple networks and all of the temples, boards of directors are involved in multiple interlocking and intersecting associations and organizations. So we're dealing with a very dense set of networks of uh, businesses supporting associations, regional associations, clan associations, and temples. Uh, so this has a long history uh, within Singapore. We can uh, look very closely at the phases of it. The 19th century, the various dialect groups first uh, established their, their uh, neighborhoods and their brought in their temp built their temples to their regional gods, and also uh, set up their uh, associations from their different divisions of their own uh, sending regions. And then we'll see that uh, as things go along, uh, there's efforts to transcend that uh, dialect-based uh, 
uh, network formation. But let's just go into this uh, step by step. Uh, Singapore in 1819 uh, really just clustered down at the mouth of the Singapore River. And if we look, zoom in there, we'll see that the areas are very specific. The yellow area are Hokkien, the, the, and behind uh, Anshang Hill, if you go down from Club Street, you get to Northbridge Road, and that's the Cantonese area in green. If you go along the go-downs, now it's Robertson Cay and all those places, that was all Chaozhou territory. And their temples are, and their regional associations are built in their neighborhoods. You don't want to cross the street. <laughs> well, no, you can cross the street if you speak, and most people in Singapore learn to, to speak the many dialects uh, for in those early days. But these are very, very different universes, uh, different language, different food, different architecture, different gods, regional pantheons, uh, and different kinds of business dealings. As we'll see, they're really quite distinct between the Hokkien, the Diujiu, and the Cantonese. Uh, but in any case, you see the same pattern occurring up uh, uh, on the other side of the Singapore River, where there are uh, groups of Cantonese living in certain areas, the uh, Hokkien and other areas. By the way, that green line is the line of the ocean in the old days, before all the reclaimed, reclaimed parts of Singapore were put in. And that uh, runs right along Telok Ayer Street. So if you were back there in the day, there is Telok Ayer Street. Uh, we're seeing it from behind, from from Xiamenjie, from Amoy Street, and uh, you see the Shenzhou Gong here in front, and then you see some of the buildings of the Tianhu Gang with some of its pavilions, really just on the seaside, facing the sea. So if you were uh, on this side, behind here would be water. Where you all are, you're standing in the ocean, <laughs> looking at, at this uh, uh, image. So. The reason it's built there is that that's where they can see all the major boats coming in, uh, coming to shore. Uh, harbor, they would sink anchor right across, right out there, and then they'd have small boats that would take their cargo up the Singapore River to the go-downs. So the captain would come in and discuss business with the uh, members of this uh, temple, with Tan, uh, Tan Tok Seng, uh, and uh, they would do business in the back hall. Uh, this business got so big that even the, uh, excuse me, there's the Hui Guan in the back hall of the Tian Ho Geng, uh, the regional association, the business office uh, for the Hokkien merchants. Uh, the Guangxu emperor realized how powerful this group had become and sent his own uh, calligraphy down to uh, recognize them and, and show his respect. He was selling a lot of, of uh, official titles at the time through his consul general here, making a lot of money for the Qing government. But uh, what's really interesting is that the temple has a, a business office or a regional association inside of it. Sometimes the regional association has a temple inside of it. It can go either way. One can contain the other. But both of them are tight, very closely interconnected. So. Uh, this is an association where you do business. Uh, this is Sid, uh, uh, Sid Ho Ki, uh, Chef Ho Ji from Malacca, who was also the second major donor for the uh, Tian Ho Geng. And he's also the main person who built the uh, Heng Shan Ting, the cemetery temple for the uh, Hokkien community. So it's, a, it's really cradle to grave. Anybody comes in uh, from Fujian is given accommodations, probably given a job, probably given a loan. Uh, if they're big merchants, big business is done in the business office. If they're coolies, the secret society that works for the temple arranges for their labor to go where they're supposed to go and how much opium they're allowed to smoke, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, as we'll see, opium plays a big part in the story too, but we'll get there. Uh, so cradle to grave, the cemeteries are available only for Hokkien people. And the Cantonese have their own, the Diojos have their own, the Hainanese have their own. All the other uh, religious groups have their own too, for that matter. This is, in fact, Tan Tok Seng's uh, tomb, which you can still visit on Utram Road uh, if you're interested. Uh, and and the, he was moved; his tomb was moved there uh, from an uh, earlier location by his son, who carried on his business after him. Uh, this is the just up the road from the Tian Ho Geng. If you continue up Telok Ayer and into Philip Street, you'll get to the Yet Hai Ching Miao. Yue Hai Qing Miao, Wat Hai Cheng Biao, which is the Chaozhou Center. Now the back room, you can see the back room of this temple. Well, you can't really see it because of that uh, line, but if you could see it, you would know that's where the Nian Gongsi was based. 
in the early days. That's, that was the business office now familiar to all Singaporeans as the Nian Gongzi. Uh, and it was run uh, as a family business by Mr. Xie Qin, who uh, also uh, controlled all the go-downs and had all the Gambier plantations on the, uh, where they were cutting down all the uh, original forest of Singapore and planting Gambier out in Tratsugang, Yotsugang and those places. Uh, now his temple also got recognition from the Guangxu Emperor because they were also an extremely important commercial uh, node in the early uh, um, years of the Singapore's history. And his tomb is actually one of the great massive, uh, last surviving great tombs in Singapore of this style. It's off of Thompson Road, but go quickly because they're building something very nearby. I don't know how much longer you can see it. It's a, it's a really quite a beautiful tomb. Uh, it's got all kinds of uh, poetry and inscriptions. It's he and his two wives and, and all sorts of uh, eulogies and so forth and poetry. Very nice to, to visit if you have a chance. Now the third community I mentioned on the other side of Angxiang Hill is the, uh, are the Cantonese and they have all their Huiguan and temples along there. You can still visit the Panyu Huiguan, several, several of them along there. Uh, Wang Pao was a famous merchant in early Singapore. He's the only uh, Chinese to be included in the executive council in those days. You see him over there. And he sponsored uh, this temple as well, but a very different pattern emerges. In the uh, Hokkien, uh, Tian Hokkien, you have the big merchants and the big donors, Tan Tok Seng, Xie Fo Ji, and everybody is listed according to how much they donate. <laughs> Xie e Qin's uh, group control, runs the uh, Nian Gong Si as a private family for several decades, several generations until uh, 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 Lin Ni Sun breaks in. Uh, but that's, uh, we'll come to that in a moment. The, the point is, it's a big family business. Everybody's working together. Uh, whereas here, everybody just contributes a same small amount, a very a token amount. Everybody's kind of considered to be equal, have, and, and they bring down the price so that everybody can be uh, kind of a member of a larger association. This may have to do with the fact that most Cantonese came in kind of later and were working in the trades as carpenters, as uh, uh, service industry, and this kind of thing, and, and not as many as Wang Po had uh, broken through into bigger commercial ranks. In any case, this is the very temple that's joined our, our one uh, C1 uh, temple network. Uh, so I want to give you a sense of how the different regions of, in this case, Fujian, the Hokkien or Minnan speaking parts of Fujian, have a series of gods that are, fam that are local to themselves, regional gods. Uh, these are all gods that Jack's written about, uh, Guangzhou Zunwang. Uh, and uh, there's others here that you'll recognize, Mazu, who becomes a nationwide god. But some of these gods are best known locally. And these are all gods who come to Singapore, as you'll see in this next slide. Here you see uh, the red temples are Mazu temples. The blue ones are Baosheng Dadi, a famous doctor uh, who's uh, worshipped alongside her in the Tian Ho Geng. Uh, the Guangzhou Zunwang uh, in yellow. Uh, Anxi Chenghuang, uh, the city god of Anxi in the light blue, and uh, even local gods like Lin Taishi from Yunxiao, uh, who uh, very few people know about, even in Fujian, but who, who are, uh, has a devoted following here. So this pattern is going to be repeated for each of the different dialect groups. The Cantonese and the Diuzhou, the Hainanese, will also have their sets of gods and their sets of temples distributed around. Now on this map, you'll see that they're clustered in Chinatown and also in Geylang. Uh, Geylang, because they can get a longer lease, uh, after 65, after uh, Singapore is established as an independent state, uh, land act goes through, the government controls most of the land. It gives only 30 year leases to temples and, and churches and so on. Every 30 years, you have to renegotiate your lease. Uh, in many cases, that meant that temples had to move or, or possibly even close down. Uh, many moved into Geylang where they could get a 90-year lease uh, because of freehold lands and other arrangements. So that's where you have now such a high cluster of such temples and, and associations. Every, every lorong, every alley has a dozen temples or association buildings right next to the brothels and the, uh, the best uh, restaurants uh, and the best uh, uh, durian in all of Singapore. Uh, so, so a very nice place to visit. Uh, now, coming to the second generation of leaders in Singapore, uh, Jiang Hongling is, takes over from his father who worked for Tan Tok Seng. Uh, 
he runs the big opium syndicate for about 20 years in Singapore. Opium was important because it uh, paid for over half of the annual budget of the colonial uh, government uh, for almost 100 years in Singapore. Uh, and that's a big chunk of the, of the budget right there. And it's, it was given out as a monopoly. They call it the opium farm. There was also alcohol, gambling, prostitution, and so on. These were all monopolies that a consortium would buy from the British government for three years at a time. And then they'd renegotiate the price and other groups would try to uh, get, put you a higher bid and so forth. So once they had it, they could uh, break it down into smaller portions and sell it to uh, people who, who smoked it for leisure, and then take what's left of that and sell it to those who smoked it just to stay alive and keep working in, in uh, very hard uh, conditions. So it was uh, an important part of the uh, labor economy as well uh, for many years. In any case, <laughs> Jiang Ponglin was also, uh, he's famous for giving Singapore the Honglin Park downtown. He's uh, built large sections of Singapore, whole sections of shop houses were built by him and his uh, group. Uh, his, uh, he also built or rebuilt a whole series of temples around Singapore, one to his home temple, the uh, true Lord of Pure Origin is from Changtai, where his father came from, where he uh, continued to worship that deity, only known in Changtai as far as I know. Uh, but anyway, he, he built a lot of these other, rebuilt a lot of these other temples. Many of them were secret society temples. Uh, the Golden Orchid, uh, Orchid Temple was famous for that. But probably most significant for our purposes is this one, the Jade Emperor Temple that he built in 1887. This was a temple where he's moving to say to everyone, we don't just have to worship our regional gods. We can all come together to worship a higher order deity, the top of the Chinese pantheon. Uh, it's kind of a symbolic encompassment, a hierarchical encompassment, if you like, of, of gods over other gods. And anybody can worship the Jade Emperor. Uh, so it's a way to move beyond only your dialect coming to your uh, regional god temple. And it's a way to create a broader network. Uh, and this was important because the whole system that had been holding Singapore together for 50 or 60 years was about to fall apart because the secret societies were going to be outlawed in 1890 because they had so many internal battles here in Singapore, uh, but also because the whole global financial system was changing and the British felt that they could uh, get a better price for the opium if they sold it to uh, people from Penang who are in the tin mining or other other kinds of possibilities. So it became a very interesting period and poor Zhang Honglin was almost banished. They were going to strip his justice of the peace title, but he fought back in the press, he fought back and, and won back his reputation and was still able to uh, die in dignity. Uh, as uh, they said at his death, he was the Jijiu, the ritual libationer of the Hokkien people. He, he had this kind of, he was this leadership of the, in a symbolic and ritual sense, as well as in a sense of being the main businessman in the region. Uh, now, this is the Jade Emperor in that temple. With the uh, outlawing of the secret societies, the whole old temple system broke apart, and there had to be a new set of leaders that came up to respond to changes in society. Those were leaders who will be very familiar to you all. Uh, Tan, Tan Kaki and Tan Dak Sai uh, were modernist reformers. They were also leaders of the, of the Fujian Hui Guan. They were also leaders of the Tian Ho King, uh, the temples. Uh, they ran all the modern schools out of there that, uh, that the Hokkien uh, Regional Association still runs to this day. They ran the cemeteries, they did everything. But their bigger interests were in building a modern China and supporting the, the growth of modern China and establishing a Chinese uh, cultural uh, basis in Singapore. And that was, of course, Nanyang University, uh, which uh, they contributed so much to uh, the land, the money, uh, bringing in all the great professors, the great library, which is now here at NUS. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, this is a, a, a sad story, uh, but it's important to show that as these men were focusing on these broader connections to uh, higher cultural uh, kinds of symbols and, and teaching uh, and, and uh, morals, a local group of leaders was continuing the growth of the temple and the expansion of the temple systems here in Singapore. So here is Wang Shui or Ong Chito, who uh, 
was also a member of the newly formed China, uh, Chamber of, of uh, Singapore Chinese uh, Chamber of Commerce, later of industry as well. He's on the far left of the, of the photo. Uh, he also was the main founder of this uh, Hogang Domogong, and this is the first uh, nine emperor god temple here in Singapore. Uh, now, the inscription is there, and it's quite interesting. It says that it's, uh, each temple has supernatural aid from the way of the gods to save the world and heal the hundred illnesses through responsive manifestations that transform disaster into good fortune. Save the world is a term used in Singapore for spirit possession. Uh, they often call this Jiu uh, Shi. And so this uh, temple was actually founded by a, a man, a, a merchant, a pineapple merchant, who'd gone up to Penang, gone into a uh, Nine Emperor temple and become possessed and uh, came back as a spirit medium, had his own small altar for a while until uh, Wang Shui and some others also came to him in illness and he cured them. And in, in gratitude, they built this temple for him. So uh, Wang Shui was the main uh, supporter of this temple. He also has the biggest tomb uh, in all of Bukit Brown. If you, if you find your way up there, and it's a little bit hidden in the jungle, but it's uh, quite a beautiful uh, tomb. Now, currently, we have about 16 temples to uh, the nine emperor gods. It's quite interesting because it's very likely that this is a Southeast Asian invention of a, a cult that began possibly in Phuket, spread to, down to Penang, across Malaysia, and then into Singapore. Uh, with very special rituals, which are uh, very Im impressive even to this day. This is the Chatsugang, uh, Nine Emperor God Temple, and these are uh, spirit mediums being possessed by each of the nine uh, emperors. And uh, they will then lead the, oh, sorry, lead the community out into the street and get ready for everybody to go off to the beach to send off the gods. They're invited from the ocean. They're uh, Fetid, uh, they're given feasts, uh, vegetarian feasts for nine days, during which time everyone wears vegetarian, uh, eats vegetarian, wears white, uh, abstains from alcohol, uh, sexual relations, and then on the ninth day they're sent back to the ocean. So these are gods who came from the ocean, went back to the ocean. Where did they really come from? It's really very interesting, and uh, this has become extremely popular in uh, in uh, Singapore these days. A lot of uh, the processions get larger every year. I want to turn to a second leader who emerged uh, around this same period in the 20s and 30s. This is, uh, uh, um, here he is, uh, Lim Ni Sun, a famous pineapple king up in Yishun, who, who really built Yishun into what it is today, or at least the early phases of that process. Uh, this temple, uh, which is uh, in Yishun now, has an inscription which describes how uh, Nimni Sun uh, donated the land, uh, set up the conditions for the expansion of, of the uh, agriculture in the region, and then uh, changed the customs and uh, involved himself in selecting the temple committee. The selection of the temple committee should be approved by Mr. Nimni Sun and his representatives. And they will then go on to organize rituals and celebrations in honor of the god of fortune and virtue. That's our earth god we've been talking about all this time, the same god. Uh, and uh, the temple will also organize educational and charitable activities. And no one in the temple committee should attempt to raise funds for other purposes. If there are any disputes within the village, these should be all resolved by the temple management board according to the principles that they run by. Uh, it shows uh, the ways in which a traditional village uh, functions and the, uh, as, as a center for dispute resolution, for gathering of funds, for charity, for education, for resolving of, of every problem in the village. And in this case, very much under the direction of, of the Pineapple King, Mr. Lin Yisun. So these individuals were really important in this uh, 30s and 40s. When you get to independence, uh, massive changes come to the Singapore built environment. This is a, 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 a typical uh, photograph from that period showing a temple being, uh, excuse me, a village, a kampong being torn down and a high rise going up, an HDB going up. This scene was repeated across Singapore uh, and hundreds of villages were removed. The white, the yellow dots are all former locations of villages in Singapore. 
Uh, the pink background or uh, behind them are the spread of the HDB in various phases from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. By the end of the 90s, there were no more villages left. Uh, so what happened to all the temples in all those villages, like the ones we just read about? Uh, excuse me. They, they all moved into these united temples like this one. Uh, each temple becomes one altar in this uh, temple. So they all get crowded into what's called a joint or united temple. Now, some of these temples are still very resilient and strong today and for various different kinds of reasons. Uh, this one, uh, the Sri Gokwan, uh, is backed by a lineage, uh, the Hong lineage. Uh, this is the inscription that they found when they expanded the road near the temple and not so long ago. It turns out to be from 1905. And it, uh, it tells the story of, uh, oops, what happened to the story? Maybe it's skipped. Oh, there it is. Okay, this story is uh, saying that we're all members of a lineage. Uh, it's uh, our lineage has been at peace and our, pe and our people have been tranquil. Tranquil, our business ventures have gone well and we've enjoyed wealth and advantages. All these things depend on the gods who bestow them. Therefore, I gathered everybody together to rebuild and uh, hold, hold rituals. Uh, great and powerful is the dynamic influence of the gods. Uh, it's a pr uh, the gods will never let us down while we offer single-hearted and sincere prayers. But what's also really interesting is at the beginning it says, we were all born in China. We all moved and built our lives amongst foreign barbarians. And we've all, uh, all lived here for a long time. Uh, we've gathered our countrymen together and worked hard. Although we've relied on this foreign government for support, we value even more our reliance on the gods, which has brought us good fortune and blessings. If we look at the uh, subscription lists at the bottom of the inscription, it's all home. They're all members of the same lineage. And so it's really a lineage uh, wrapped up as a temple. <laughs> There's not, they don't have a lineage hall, but they have a temple in which they do many of their rituals. Now, other temples of this uh, united form that took uh, shape in this time uh, bring together a whole series of temples that were scattered in the villages. In this case, a series of temples dedicated to Guandi. But uh, they had originally branched off one temple to Geylang. When that temple got turned down, they all, uh, torn down, they all came back together to create a joint temple once again. And so these inscriptions tell the stories of all these different groups that are dealing with the, the uh, appropriation of their lands and their need to create a common space together built around common worship, in this case of the Emperor Guandi. Now, a lot of these associations gathered together finally in the, 18, in the 1980s and 90s uh, under the leadership of the Lorong uh, um, Jotaipa City God Temple. And uh, the founder of that, Chan Tianlai, uh, became the founder of the uh, Singapore Taoist Federation. Uh, this is a federation that includes four or 500 temples, all of whom need some kind of uh, political voice, put it that way, because so many of them are confronting the end of their 30 year lease. And so this group can help intervene and, and work with local politicians and members of parliament and try to uh, do what they can on behalf of their uh, members of their federation. So this is again a, a transformation in the nature of networking uh, in now in relation to city uh, to the city state, <laughs> the, the, the country of Singapore. The Singapore after building the HDB also took over many of the functions of these uh, associations and temples. Uh, they took over health care, they took over cemeteries, they took over medicine, uh, uh, sorry, education. All of these things have been run through the associations in the past. So the question then becomes, what is the future for these associations? What role can they play now? If everything's being handled by the state, what, what can they contribute in this situation? I'm going to suggest one thing that they can do that's very interesting. Uh, they can transcend dialect and ethnic barriers once again. And I'm going to give an example from the Guanyin, <laughs> Guanyin Tang uh, Fo Zhu Miao, uh, which I'm very, very honored to have the professorship from them. They've sponsored five or six professorships around NUS alone, most of them in the sciences. Uh, but uh, it's a remarkable institution, probably in the top 10, certainly possibly the top five for charitable institutions in Singapore. Millions of dollars are given to medic medicine, education, uh, social services uh, every year. And they're uh, a really a remarkable institution in this uh, country. 
Every year, at the beginning of the Chinese New Year's, people line up outside in the streets, thousands of people, because they want to do the toushang, the very first uh, incense stick of the brand new New Year's. If you can put the first one in, you'd be the first one to do it. You have tremendous good luck for the rest of the year. For a long time, I thought that the CMIO system here would keep groups kind of apart, respectful, but not really understanding each other. So this is a kind of a, an alternative to that perspective, which I got by reading the works of Daniel Goh, a sociologist here who uh, wrote an essay called In the Place of Ritual, describing the, t the first night of Chinese New Year when he was in the temple watching this scene. <laughs> and he said, all the people come crowding in trying to put in the incense stick. You could see how excited people are getting when they're getting up close to it. And it's like, wow, what an achievement to finally uh, get that uh, Toshang <laughs> uh, put in there. So this is, uh, this is a temple that attracts people from all over Singapore and Southeast Asia. It's uh, the Guanyin Pusa there is considered incredibly ling. And so everybody wants to go uh, when they uh, visit for that purpose. So there's always a big uh, crowd around there. But that night of Toshiang, after the crowd has gathered inside and, and uh, done their initial worship, they go out into the street and they go down the street to the in Krishna temple next door. And they all swarm into the Krishna temple, thousands and thousands of people. And it's an astonishing sight uh, because inside the Krishna temple, people are worshiping the, the uh, Hindu deities. There is a Guanyin statue in there too, by the way, but, but it's not the central statue. Or, uh, and these are all statues from the Tamil Nadu uh, tradition. So it's a moment where you see a real transcending of, of ethnic boundaries and a real respect for the deities of a different uh, community. I thought about this for a long time and I started to look for other examples. I found this temple out in Yishun, the Fa, uh, Fa, uh, Fu Fa Gong, which has, as you see, a Krishna temple built into the side of it. And I asked, why? Why do you have that temple there? They said, when we were in our kampong, we had the temple right next door to each other. And when they had a ritual, we would go. And when we had a ritual, they would come. So we still do it. So the Indian community, even though everybody's scattered all over Singapore, they all come back for Krishna's celebrations and also for the uh, Chinese gods, birthdays. So I said, wow, that's really interesting. Are there any more examples in Singapore? And then I found Boyang Dabogong out in Changi. It originally was a small temple by the, by the beach, also with uh, Chinese gods and Indian gods that had washed up on the shore and been put together in a wayside shrine. By the way, there's hundreds of wayside shrines in Singapore that include deities from multiple faiths. This place is amazing though, because it includes a Indian temple with Brahmin priests uh, uh, taking care of the worship of Ganesh, a giant Ganesh statue there. And uh, also, there's a whole set of directions for how you're supposed to worship. When you show up, you should go in into a certain order. You should first worship the Ganesh, then you should worship the uh, uh, Karamat, the uh, Nadugong, who is at the back of the uh, Ganesh. And then you should go in to worship Dabogong, the earth god or the god of uh, good fortune, uh, wealth and good fortune. Uh, now you can also go to the back of that temple and you can worship the yin version and you can get a lottery ticket from their abacus and race off to the state lottery to uh, see if you win. Uh, now the, this is a temple supported and by the temple committee. All sorts of Taoist priests are invited for the birthdays of the gods. Here you see uh, the Temple Committee with uh, the Taoist priests and a few of their close friends. Uh, I attended a banquet there for 10,000 people uh, in their par big parking lot. So they're a very wealthy temple now, huge location, but like Guan Yin Tang, they donate their money almost immediately to social welfare, uh, medicine, and uh, other uh, education, Hong uh, Bao for the elderly, all kinds of, they're very quick to move their, their money into the social welfare process. Um, however, they also have Indian rituals throughout the year, and the temple committee members, as you can see, are participating actively in those. Here you see them lining up. I asked the gentleman in mustache uh, <laughs> uh, why this was happening. He says, you know, first of all, there's our Kampong history of worshipping together. Then the fact is that in recent years, we've all, our temple leaders have gone to India and found a guru there. And so we, we feel that we're learning more about the traditions that are, are part of what we're uh, involved in here in Singapore. So this is the Indian community coming out for some of these rituals. Now, I mentioned, is this the past or the future? Uh, in terms of the past, if you go to the Sri Mariamman Temple on uh, Southbridge Road, one of the earliest Indian temples, you find an inscription 
uh, they're in multiple languages. <laughs> uh, so, and one corner is written in Chinese where they talk about uh, Dabo Gong. Xinjiapo uh, Dabo Gong, they're calling Meriamam uh, Dabo Gong, which is fine. It's, uh, it's a, a Chinese version calling him the Earth God uh, as he is important uh, to the Indian community there. So that from the very beginning, we have this kind of multi-ethnic uh, uh, community working around these kinds of visions of understanding each other's deities and sharing in each other's worship. More recently, we have uh, the issue of the new migrants to Singapore. They too have formed a network and this is their fourth association. They're going to have their award ceremony uh, in a couple months. Uh, there are about 6,000 members now. Uh, this is a community that's trying to build on the same networking techniques that I first discussed in uh, Ihai Imiao, one, one see one temple. Uh, they're also trying to make connections to politicians, to regional associations. Many regional associations are now reaching out to the new immigrants. Uh, the Jinjiang uh, Huiguan, uh, Jinjiang Regional Association is welcoming new migrants. To, you know, they can learn Hokkien <laughs> if they want, but they can also have uh, engagement with the youth groups, with the, with the women's groups, with uh, all sorts of cultural activities. So there's all kinds of ways in which the uh, traditional networks are dealing with all kinds of new challenges in the contemporary period. And I think that the example of the Ihai Imiao really shows us that the importance in all this of modern social media and communications. Uh, I was at the, uh, uh, the Cantonese Earth God Temple the other day and the, uh, the advisor there who's, who's made this connection was on the phone with the people in Cebu. And some of them were driving to work in their car, they were talking on the phone at the same time, and others were uh, uh, at the temple already uh, getting ready for activities of the day. He also had somebody on the line from Sinkawang. So all of us were talking together uh, in the office of this Cantonese Earth God Temple here in Singapore. Uh, this is just kind of extraordinary to me that people are able to communicate so uh, seamlessly and to use this then to create even broader networks. Global networks are the next wave. The, uh, the clan associations, the Xing Shi Hui, the, each clan association is now creating a global uh, network. And once you have a global network of all the chuns, all the tan in the world, uh, it has a, a kind of a feedback effect on all the lower levels. The regional offices, the village uh, uh, lineage hall now knows that it can also uh, appeal to the global membership, the global board, and uh, mobilize all kinds of different resources in this day and age. So I, I think that there's still a, a role, a lot of interesting roles for the associations and temples in Singapore uh, to explore in the coming uh, years. I, uh, some of their functions have been <laughs> replaced by, by the state here, but others are emerging even as we speak, as new networks are formed, as new uh, connections are made, and as uh, new opportunities, business and cultural, are, are pursued. So I better leave it there because I've already talked for a long time, and I want to leave some time for questions, uh, and. Uh, Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really very nice to see you all and appreciate your taking the time to, to come out. And I uh, hope uh, I've shown you something interesting and we can uh, discuss this uh, together for a few minutes uh, after this talk. So th thank you. Well, th th thank you, Professor Dean, for the really wonderful talk. I, l I learned so much, as always, uh, as we head into the Q&A segment. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions, and we will hand the microphone over to you. And uh, I think we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So uh, may I uh, also invite our online audience, uh, please uh, enter your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so in the interest of time, I will collect a few questions. So please keep your questions brief though, uh, and no mini lecture, please. All right. So yes, the floor is open. Uh, could you please uh, identify your, yourself? 
My name is Christian Lentz. I'm a fellow at ARI this semester. I'm very interested in what you said at the end about um, blurring boundaries and sort of creating new kinds of communities. But the examples that you gave tended to be between groups or members of polytheistic faiths, between an Indian group and a Chinese group with many different gods that could easily assimilate one another. I'm wondering if, on, if by contrast, you might see the creation of different kinds of boundaries between those perhaps between polytheist, polytheist, polytheistic faiths and monotheists theistic faiths, for example, thinking about Christianity or Islam and others. Yeah, I think this is a... Shall, shall we collect a oh, few sure, sure. questions? Uh, any... Uh, yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Sayaka Chatani. I'm in the history department. I'm a colleague with Jack. Um, I, my question is the political imperative of this Ihai Miao. You just me mentioned some, you know, um, the, the, the presence of the state in Macau, but, and also you mentioned that there was some deliberately bottom up network building, but is it like how deliberate and how anti state it is? And I want to hear more about that. Perhaps we can take one more question. A new one. I think I'll have a hard yeah, time with the first two. <laughs> so maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I try to respond. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, the example of Luoyang Dabogong is perhaps exceptional in Singapore in that it includes a uh, karamat, and there's an explanation on their website which they partly disavow, but nonetheless provide uh, a, a uh, interpretation of how uh, Muslim saints' uh, tombs became uh, important sites of worship in Malaysia and Singapore, and this was a, a major uh, uh, part of the religious landscape that they wanted to honor as well. Uh, many of the Chinese temples have uh, shrines to Nadu Gong, uh, a local uh, Malay spirit of the earth, got uh, outside of the temple. And uh, one temple uh, inscription I found in Bao Chir Gong off of Havelock Road uh, actually created a legal document. Uh, it's, a, it's a Taoist legal document saying that we have the legal right, which we've gotten from the Taoist gods, to ask all of the local deities to kindly leave. <laughs> uh, but we offer you sublimation through our ritual means, but we are insisting that you cannot come back to haunt the place. Uh, so, uh, and we have legal proof in the form of this document. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a, of a uh, one-sided one, one uh, document, but it, it still shows some recognition that uh, people are aware that they're entering into interactions uh, with other communities and other faiths. Uh, now, the, the continued worship of Nadugung is a very interesting phenomenon, and uh, increasingly at the uh, large ceremonies with multiple spirit possession, uh, taking place, we find uh, f figures such as Nadu Gung also being possessed uh, and entering into these broader uh, uh, coalitions of, of spirit mediums uh, partying together, if you like. <laughs> so that's a very interesting phenomenon. Now, Christian groups, I think, have tried more through dialogue uh, when, when they're interested in dialogue. And there are groups here that are emphasized religious harmony and try to establish uh, communication. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, tradition of this in the study of Christianity in Southeast Asia, which emphasizes the kind of existential stakes and the big uh, crisis of conversion and how that throws many communities into a, a really uh, uh, amb ambivalent relationship with their earlier customs. But there's another anthropology of Catholicism in Southeast Asia, which tends to show that a lot of the Catholic communities worked more closely with Adat, with earlier traditions, and were more accommodating and, and more welcoming of those traditions. So I think the, the story is quite complicated. I don't think there's any one clear answer to your question, but thank you for asking. Uh, so as for the political stakes, I think many of these Chinese temples are in, uh, what you might call Chinese uh, minority states. The, you know, the people in Cebu, the population there is probably a third uh, Malay, a third Chinese, and a third Dayak. If, if the Dayak aren't even more, it might be half. 
and then 25% uh, each for the Chinese and Malay. So, and by Dayak, I'm encompassing a vast range of different uh, communities, Iban and uh, all kinds. Uh, so I just mean indigenous communities of multiple uh, uh, traditions and so on. So the political stakes though are somewhat different than in Singapore, which is Chinese majority uh, place. So uh, I think that that's one consideration for forming alliances um, and creating connections amongst the Chinese communities in Sarawak initially and into uh, across Borneo. But then make, taking it international is uh, something that could only happen in recent years with uh, air transport, transportation and uh, social media communications. And I think that that is, in fact, a response to the top-down kind of uh, vision of the, uh, the Idai Ilu. Um, and the, the fact that they're able to draw strength, a sense of strength from gathering together and supporting one another seems to me to indicate a, a horizontal kind of non-statist uh, vision uh, where every, every group is supporting the other and uh, at the regional, at the... Uh, national and at the transnational level. So the question of whether the Chinese government could try to get a seat at the table in such an association is a really interesting one, but it hasn't happened yet. So I don't know how that's go <laughs> that story is going to go, but it's, it's an interesting possibility, it seems to me. Uh, Erica? Sure, the online audience is also quite engaged, so I'd just like to relay some of the, the questions. Uh, perhaps to start out, um, there's one audience member that wants to ask uh, Professor Dean's thoughts on the role of tourism in the development of the temples, especially in the years following independence. And they cite specifically the Kusu Island Duapekong Temple, which is visited by devotees from Thailand and, and Indonesia. Thank you very much, Erica, and thank you, uh out there uh, to 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 the our online audience uh, the uh, question is a very good one and certainly tourism has been a big part of the whole cultural heritage process the national monument process uh, i i think that there's all kinds of two edges to anything when you try to really make a place uh, friendly for tourists, you may drive the original inhabitants out <laughs> uh, or change the nature of the original location. Even the temples may feel a little museumified. Or, uh, but I haven't found that to be too much the case in Singapore. The, these big temples along Telakayer are all national monuments. Uh, they've all spent millions of dollars in reconstruction and redevelopment. The, they're a big part of the tourist uh, business here. But they all still carry out important rituals themselves for their communities. And when the goddess Mazu arrived from uh, from Putian, uh, from Meijo Island, uh, seated in business class, I should let you know, uh, uh, she uh, was carried through the streets of Singapore uh, with uh, all kinds of dragons and, and, and lions uh, welcoming her and a Taoist priest and a huge celebration. Uh, six, uh, and it seemed to be a, a very joyous uh, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, welcoming of, of the goddess back to the temples here. So I, even in the Gusu Island case, it's certainly a tourist location. Not, nobody lives there as far as I know anymore. Uh, maybe some of the temple keepers. But what's interesting about Gusu Island is precisely the Karamat that's located on one corner of the island. And as far as I know, they, the temple committees were merged at one point. I'm not sure if it's still the case. And uh, a lot of the tourists and pilgrims who go out for Guanyin's birthday celebrations with the uh, beautiful nan, Nanyin uh, music from the uh, Xionglin uh, Yeshe here, uh, also visit the Karamat. And that Karamat has a connection to Wang Shui Do, one of the figures I mentioned here with the nine emperor gods. He has put uh, inscriptions up at the Karamat of the uh, Islamic saint and his wife and his daughter. And they say that a spirit medium on Rangoon Street here in Singapore was possessed by that god, by that saint, uh, in, in the 1920s. And so he's, he found that that's to be so extraordinary that he had inscriptions made in Arabic, in, in uh, Jawi, and in uh, uh, Chinese, uh, and in English, and he put them around the, uh, the Karamat. So 
To this day, many people go there. Uh, it's said that if you spend the night sleeping next to the tomb, you may be, become pregnant. I don't know <laughs> if there's any truth to this rumor, but uh, there's uh, a lot of people go uh, to both the temples when they visit. So I find that it still has a lot of uh, religious dimensions, even though it's primarily a tourist site most of the year. I hope that answers uh, that person's question. And that sounds like a potential research or experiment for a senior thesis project. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have time for another round of questions. There's also a couple of online questions wondering about young people, young Singaporeans, and what kind of roles they play in the temple, uh, in the temples and the associations, and whether young people are going um, to temples. I think that's always a, an interesting and important question. When I was doing field work in Fujian, it always amazed me there were young people, uh, children, and elderly people attending all these uh, event, uh, activities. The middle-aged people were all sort of off to the side, being, being busy, making money. And uh, once they had made money and were slightly older, they wanted a seat in the temple committee. <laughs> and then they found their way back. Uh, at a, uh, so I think part of this is a question of uh, ages in one's life and uh, the roles that one goes cycles through in relation to one's traditions. But here in Singapore, I found most interesting are these nine emperor god festivals where many of the uh, mediums and many of the uh, worshippers and many of the sedan chair carriers are younger people, uh, teenagers into their 20s and 30s. And I really hadn't anticipated that. But I found that each year I go, there are even more uh, people uh, involved at that age group. Now, within the associations, most of them have youth group already set up in women's groups and education groups and cultural activity groups, language study, and a host of activities designed, uh, martial arts, uh, lion dancing, all these kinds of things designed to attract younger people in. But most of them also complain about the difficulty of doing so. <laughs> and it is admittedly a, a huge problem uh, for some of the smaller uh, associations that ask for membership fees, and that's a problem for some younger people. Uh, trying to give them responsibility when the temple committee is still firmly in control <laughs> or uh, has difficulty re releasing control. Uh, those are generational problems. But as I, as I mentioned in relation to the Ch Chinese fieldwork example, it may be a matter of uh, waiting for their uh, turn to uh, really have that responsibility thrust upon them. <laughs> I, I hope that answers the question to some degree. We have time for one final question. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. That was an <laughs> extraordinary presentation in terms of the scope of material you covered. I, I asked a question to Jack on, a, on when I saw him speak a while ago around the conservation of the material culture. And, and so in terms of temples, um, how does that get funded? I don't know these are broad questions, but in terms of the, the the flat network you talk about, does then are there kind of stipulations around the kind of the ways in which the material culture is cared for and curated, um, or is that a really kind of autonomous process? So the funding structures that flow between the different locations, does that then come around kind of the ways in which the material culture should be thought about and, and all of those complexities around that, which I'm not able to summarise, but I guess you get a sense of. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th those are. Really important questions. I remember Professor uh, Hamashita always saying to me, "Follow the money, <laughs> and and you'll you'll understand how the network works." Uh, he's probably right. Uh, most of these uh, uh, inscriptions, I've just shared the the text with you, but the bulk of the inscription are the uh, contributions, and they're almost like an X-ray of the of the social status of of all the members of the uh, association and their. Uh, and then if you look at the commemorative volumes, another uh, item of material culture produced by many of these associations every 10 years or so, uh, the, the whole back half are advertisements from, from all the companies that are sponsoring the temples. So uh, through those, you can also get a uh, snapshot or an x-ray of, of the whole uh, commercial sector. And we know that uh, immigration here was 
uh, kind of uh, through economic niches and, and corridors of, of migration where people were brought into the same industry and then sent along all, all along the archipelago uh, to set up uh, branch uh, organizations of a, of a company or an industry. So this follows very naturally from that uh, immigration pattern. Nowadays, there's still a vast circulation of material objects coming, uh, paper money, spirit money, where is it made? <laughs> where all this money that's burned here? Uh, all, all the gods that are carved. We only have a few god carving uh, shops left in, in, in Singapore. But the gods are coming out of Taiwan, they're coming out of China. Uh, there's a circulation not only of these material objects, but uh, ritual specialists who can also circulate through Southeast Asia and uh, or uh, ritual performers of ritual plays, uh, all of which requires a huge uh, uh, material cultural paraphernalia, uh, robes, uh, altar hangings, uh, all of these things are uh, incredible. One of my students uh, found an old shop that's closing down in Geylang uh, that used to bring in instruments for the Chaozhou opera and all the uh, costumes and uh, all, all the uh, uh, kinds of connections to uh, ritual that would be performed in all the temples necessarily. Now, he, they found about a thousand business documents in this in this one family's collection, uh, showing all the ways that these things were ordered back in Chaozhou from the uh, uh, shops that did the embroidery all the way to the uh, merchants that, that transmitted the goods here and and the sales locally, and the, and the so this is a, a very long history of of, of uh, a lot of material objects being moved through these networks. Uh, underlying them as uh, flows of cash, but they take a uh, rather beautiful form in, in the uh, uh, ritual artifacts that are used and in the incredibly beautiful god statues that we can still find in the uh, uh, temples in Singapore. So thank you for that question. And uh, with that, our time is up. So please join me in thanking uh, Professor Dean for the wonderful lecture. Thank you, Jack. Uh, that was very nice you. of you. Thank you. And, uh, Quick announcement uh, from EIUS. Uh, love to hear your experience this evening. Please scan the QR code on the screen uh, to let us know your feedback. And thank you very much again for your time, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.